With Ralph's guidance, I contributed my first cataloging record to OCLC, and here it is. When a score or sound recording was cataloged at IU, OCLC printed a set of cards and shipped them to the library for filing in the catalog under author, title, subject, and so forth. Hundreds of cards arrived from OCLC each week in long boxes, and student workers did the filing. Anyone filing cards in the catalog left them resting on top of the rod so a supervisor could check their work. When I saw Ralph that first time, that's what he was doing. In the late 1970s, librarians looked forward to the arrival of the online catalog. There would be no more filing and correcting cards. When online catalogs did become available in the early 1980s, only a small part of library holdings had been input as mark records, so the card catalog was still necessary, but it was no longer maintained. Most libraries set a day one for their online catalog. All cataloging after that date was available only in the online catalog, and everything earlier was still in the card catalog. For, for a search to be complete, users had to search both the online catalog and the card catalog. Many years passed before the content of card catalogs were converted to mark and the catalogs could be discarded or shipped to storage and forgotten. A few months after I began my first job in 1981 as a music cataloger at Northwestern University, I attended my first MLA annual meeting, and I learned that these meetings were where music librarians worked on the issues facing the profession. There were still kinks to be smoothed out in interpreting AACR2, and discussions were beginning about what music users would need in an online catalog. At that time, the Library of Congress was a leader in the music cataloging community. LC was the de facto national library and held a position of respect and authority. It had one of the largest music cataloging staffs in the country, and they produced cataloging we all relied on. At MLA annual meetings, LC staff reported at length on activities at the library, and they sat on all the committees related to bibliographic control. By the early 1980s, music librarians were growing frustrated with LC's delays in implementing the MARC music format. LC continued to issue cataloging for music and sound recordings only on cards, and the delay meant more work for those librarians already cataloging online. LC didn't begin distributing MARC records for its music cataloging until early 1984, eight years after the format had been published. In the meantime, the music catalogers using OCLC had moved forward on their own and set the direction for the use of MARC. In 1976, a group of MLA members met several times with OCLC to advise them on music work forms, printing catalog cards, and input standards. And this led to OCLC's publication of guidelines for cataloging scores and sound recordings. Within a few years, shared music cataloging and OCLC had achieved critical mass. In 1982, Richard Smaralia was chair of Moog, and Ralph was completing his third year as editor of the Moog newsletter, which had become an important resource for music catalogers. Catalogers turned to OCLC and Moog for guidance in this new online environment. LC retained control over the development of cataloging standards and policy, but leadership in helping members of the catalog community adapt to new ways of doing their work fell to grassroots organizations like Moog. Between MLA meetings, Ralph and I stayed in touch through letters and phone calls, and we were early adopters of email. At first, sending email was more complicated than typing a letter and putting it in the mail. Because the computer terminal in my office at Northwestern was connected only to the cataloging system, to send email, I had to leave my office in the music library and walk several hundred yards to the main library, where there was a short, dark hallway with half a dozen VT100 terminals connected to a VAX mainframe a few buildings away. 
Email accounts were available only by request, and I was among the first people in the library to get one. At lunchtime and on breaks, I walked through the library to the shadowy hallway to log into the VAX and check for new email. During those early days, I got email only from Ralph, and I suspect he didn't get much email from anybody but me. By the end of the decade, a few hundred music librarians had email accounts and needed a way to communicate with each other. Ralph's wife, Mary, was an IBM mainframe operator at IU, and in 1989, she installed the Listserv software on one of the computers she maintained. A few months later, MLAL was the first email list to go live on her mainframe. Ralph invited me to join him in setting up and administering the list. Today, MLAL has been in use for 32 years, and it has endured because it uses one of the few technologies that has remained unchanged since the 1980s email. It's simple and boring, but remarkably reliable. Ralph and I served on the MLA board together in the late 1980s and early 1990s. After that, we stayed in touch, and our main point of contact was MLAL. By the early 2000s, Ralph was sick and getting sicker. When I moved to the East Coast and remarried, I saw him only at the annual MLA meetings when we'd have lunch together and chat at receptions. My wife met Ralph at the 2003 meeting in Austin. She immediately liked him, probably because he spoke to her earnestly without ego or affect. That's the way he spoke to everyone, to library school students and to library directors. Ralph's words came out with intent and purpose in their own time and without any uhs, errs, or ums. His voice was low and rough and his intonation was flat. At MLA receptions, some people work the room strategically and they spend no more than a few minutes with one person. You've probably seen these people. I remember a former MLA president who greeted me at the opening reception, and then as I talked, they began scanning the room, looking for someone more important. Ralph was always satisfied talking to whoever was standing in front of him, and often spent half an hour chatting with a first-time attendee who had wandered up to him, having no idea who he was. Ralph had no problem talking with me and my wife about his medical issues. Because my wife was a physician, she could read things between the lines of his narrative that I couldn't see, and it wasn't good. After one of these conversations with Ralph, she told me she thought the doctors in Indianapolis had made some bad decisions when he first became ill. Later, as his condition worsened, he traveled to the Cleveland Clinic where he got better care. Still, he was sick and wasn't improving. He went through several rounds of chemotherapy. He lost weight and became frail. Ralph and I always let each other know when we were traveling and would be unable to keep tabs on MLAL. I sent him an email in December 2009 to let him know my plans for the winter holidays, but he didn't reply. In January 2010, Sustanchu wrote to let me know his condition was getting worse. I began drafting an obituary. On January 14th, Phil Pinella sent an email to several of us to let us know that Ralph had died that morning. At Ralph's request, there was no burial, funeral, or memorial service. The 10th anniversary of Ralph's death led me to think back on what was going on in the profession during that period when he had such a great influence on me. The 1980s were transformational for librarianship. After decades of stasis in the way we did our work, there was disruption, and it happened at a pace that was exciting and challenging. There was more change in those 10 years than there had been in the preceding 50. 
The transformation took place through technology, and the changes that started in the 1980s continued through the succeeding decades. The 1980s marked the beginning of a long transition from analog to digital that started with a move from paper to pixels, from the card catalog to the online catalog, and from typed correspondence to email. With the evolution of technology in the 1980s came changes in the roles librarians played in the profession. The scope of the impact of our work shifted from local to global. Ralph Papakian started the decade standing in front of a card catalog that, had, that was seen and used by only the several dozen people walking into Indiana's music library each day. By the end of the decade, his institution's cataloging was seen, used, and enhanced by hundreds of people across the world. Imagine someone who enjoys singing in the shower, being pushed up to the microphone in a vast, noisy arena. It would be comfortable for some, but not for others. Shoved onto the global stage of OCLC, catalogers' work was exposed, and they quickly established reputations. The work of some was gratefully adopted, while the work of others was shunned. In the 1980s, technology began offering new ways for users to access library collections and services. With content no longer tied to physical objects, we started down the path to remote access. As time passed, we were able to share this digital content in larger amounts and at faster speeds. Wired networks of the 1980s and 1990s evolved into wireless networks in the early 2000s, and finally into mobile networks. Computing devices shrank in size and were soon smaller than a paperback book. Once we were using portable devices on wireless networks, remote access blossomed and the locus of teaching, research, and work shifted from a specific place to any place. Resources and services that had been available only in the library before the 1980s were now in our pockets and purses, in airports and in bars. Ten years ago, while sitting with my family in a noisy restaurant waiting for food to arrive, my younger son asked what song was blaring out of an overhead speaker. I pulled out my phone, and a few seconds later, I had the answer. My older son, who was then in his 20s, shook his head and said with a smirk, there are no more mysteries. Thanks to technology, there are fewer mysteries around the dinner table. It can settle scores, but often kills conversation. Also, when you're used to answering most questions easily, we can feel anxious when we encounter a question that can't be answered. We start assuming there are quick answers to every question. Some people even end up accepting any answer just to avoid being left without an answer. Easy information access has made us less patient when looking for answers. Maybe it's time to step back and reconsider. There are benefits to encountering obstacles and having to take time to arrive at answers. Obstacles force us to pause, and they present opportunities to make other discoveries. Today, I can learn about the canon that Joseph Haydn wrote in honor of Venanzo Rauzzini's dog named Turk while sitting at the breakfast table. In 1978, when I was looking for this dog in the reference stacks at Indiana, the process was far slower, but I ended up learning about more than Haydn's canon. As I pulled books from the shelf, I was being introduced to research tools, and I was learning how to use them. And while sitting at that long table surrounded by reference books, I saw across the room someone standing at the card catalog doing something strange and intriguing something that would end up changing the course of my life. Thank you.